Good day, everyone, and thank you for joining me today. We have been doing a new study entitled Defining the Word Heart and Examining Its Use in Scripture. This will be the second study, and if you'd like to go back and look up the video from the first one, we looked at the different definitions of heart. There are three parts of you that the word heart can refer to. You, the spirit, your soul, mind, will, and emotions, or your body. Sometimes it applies to your spirit and your soul together. We're all familiar with different verses that use the word heart. Create in me a clean heart. Out of the heart proceed evil thoughts and adultery, circumcision of the heart. That's Romans 2.29. You have obeyed from the heart, Romans 6.17. Every man as he purposes in his heart, let him give, 2 Corinthians 9.7. And Ephesians 5.19, singing and making melody in your heart unto the Lord. Those are just some examples of verses in which the word heart has been used. And in this session... We're going to keep it very simple. We're just going to take some of these verses and we're going to look at them. Plus, we're going to have our patriarchs helping us today. These little men, I call them my patriarchs. Hallelujah. They represent you. You, the spirit, you possess a soul, and you live in a body. Paul said you are three parts. I pray God, he said, 1 Thessalonians 5.23, your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. So there are times, as we said, when the verse heart applies to the spirit, to the spirit of man. It can apply to the, the soul, your mind, your will, and your emotions. And a few times it even applies to your physical heart. Then there are occasions when the word heart applies to your spirit and your soul together. Peter talked about the inward man or the hidden man of the heart. That's referring to your spiritual being, which is made up of you, the spirit, and your soul. So, and especially as a new believer living under the new covenant of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, having been made a new creation, I presume, or if you haven't, you can be, that it is important for you to be able to rightly divide and see clearly how this word heart is being used. These will be very practical helps for you. When you read a verse that has heart in it, hmm, now does that apply to me, the spirit man, the new creation? Does it apply to my soul? Hmm, well, you're going to find it very interesting. Let's pray today. Father, I thank you today for clarity. I thank you, Father, that truly your word is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. Holy Spirit, enlighten the eyes of our understanding. Father, make it what seems to be a complex subject. Help it to be simple. Oh, Father, and I do thank you. For clarity, maturity coming to the body of Christ as we look into this scripture. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, in lesson one, I had a handout prepared. And this is available. I'll put a link for it below. It's available at my Bible school site here online, and I took the Greek definitions of the word heart, 
and I made a little spreadsheet with them. The Greek word for heart is cardia. The white is represents your physical heart. The orange, your soul and its functions. And the green, your spirit and its functions. So just going back here for just a second. On this page right here, which was page five of last week's notes, this was a list of the definitions that you'll find in the grid. The word cardia, heart, refers to the seat of your physical life, your physical vigor, the outward you. Then we have the soul as the fountain and seat of your thoughts, passions, appetites, affections, purposes, endeavors, emotions, and desires. Whew. The underlying, the understanding, I'm sorry, the understanding, your mind. So it's like the first definition that included your thoughts, your passions, your affections, and things. That referred to your entire soul. Then another definition, it was just your mind, your understanding. Then in another definition they gave for cardia, it was your will and your character. Hmm. Then we have a couple here that refer to your entire inward man, spirit and soul. The middle, central, or inmost part of you. Your entire mental and moral activity. The hidden springs of your personal life that influence the whole circuit of your action. I thought that was very good. The entire, your entire mental and emotional activity, which is a hidden spring on the inside of you that influences the whole circuit of your action, everything you do. That's what the verse says. Out of the heart, you know, comes life, the inward springs, life or death. Then we have the definition, it is the seat from which divine influence makes itself known in those who are born again. It is the residence. This is talking about you, the new creation now. Where God exerts his divine influence from in your life. It is the residence of faith. So this is telling us faith in this particular instance does not, is, doesn't have its seat in the mind, but in the new creation. The hidden man, the real man, spirit and soul. Then we have the seat of grief, joy, perceptions, thoughts, reasonings, powers, and imaginations. Hmm. That a lot of that is the mind, your mind, and your emotions. You just, your soul, reading through these definitions, I realized how complex our soul is. Mm -mm. That's why, again, it is so important just to get a few tips here on understanding why we need to be able to discern which part of us the word heart is referring to. In Greek, it's the same word, cardia. But in its application, it can apply to you the spirit, you the soul, to your body, it can apply to your entire being. It can apply to your physical heart. So let's begin and look at some verses now. 
1 Thessalonians 5.23 that we've referred to before, Paul writes, I pray God your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. You are a spirit. You possess a soul, mind, will, and emotions, and you live in a body. You are a triune being like God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You are spirit, soul, and body. Now let's just for a minute look again at the definitions so that you can actually see them. And I've simplified them, made them very simple this time. Boiled it all down, I guess you could say. I'm cooking in my kitchen again, stirring in a cooking and a boiling. <laughs> So here again we have our definitions, but boiled down. The Greek word is cardia. It can mean your physical heart, the vigor of your physical life, outward you, your body. It can mean the center and seat of your spiritual life, the inward you, the real you, the spirit and soul. Then it can mean in the definitions of soul, we had the fountain and seat of your thoughts, passions, appetites, affections, purposes, choices, endeavors, emotions, and desires. Whew, now that was a list. But if you look at it, it's just really simple. You have the physical heart, then you have your inward being, either meaning you the spirit or you and your soul, the hidden man of the heart. And just defining the soul a little more, we see all of these different things that manifest themselves from your mind, your will, and your emotions. So next we're going to look at a verse, a very popular verse. As a matter of fact, I even heard it today. Psalm 51.10 well, Psalm 51.10, in the portion that I want to pick up out of it, and I'm sure that you're all familiar with it, Create in me a clean heart and renew a right spirit within me. We hear this verse quite often. So, I have a question that I would like to ask you, getting out you, <laughs> you the new creation, full of the life of God. Your mind may not be completely renewed yet, so he's gray. Your mind is a little in the dark yet. In your body, you are a spirit. You possess a soul. You live in a body. Second Corinthians 5.17, if you are in Christ, you are a new creation. You are full of the life of God in your spirit. So if we use this verse, create in me a clean heart and renew a right spirit within me, which part of you is that referring to? Your spirit, your soul, or your body? No. Hmm, I guess I never thought about that before. Well, thinking about it now, we're thinking about it now. If you are a new creation, you have been made a new creature in Christ Jesus. God has already created in you a clean heart. Remember the word cardia, heart. And we're going to look at the definition here in the Hebrew also, just to make it clear. The word cardia in the Greek can refer to spirit, soul, or body, one of the three parts of you. So, if God has created a new you, applying the word heart to spirit, you the recreated spirit, God has already created in you a clean heart. He has, how does that say that created me a clean heart? He has renewed a right spirit on the inside of you. 
If any man be in Christ, that which is born of the flesh is flesh, Jesus said, that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. And that was one of the promises that God gave in the New Testament. A new heart and a new spirit will I put within you. Thinking about the context of this verse, Isaiah 51, in Isaiah 51, 30, this was the prayer of David after he had been caught in the transgression with Bathsheba, confronted by the prophet. And he was repenting greatly before the Lord. Now David, bless his heart, lived before the cross. He had no hope of getting a clean, applying it to his spirit, because he also, this is David, let's act like this is David. He is a spirit, he possesses a soul, he lives in a body. But in his spirit, he has a sinful nature, because before the cross, no one became a new creation. It took the blood of Jesus to open the way for you to become a new creature in Christ Jesus. David, living under the old covenant with the blood of bulls and goats, had a sinful nature. When he said, create in me a clean heart and renew a right spirit within me, it could have meant his whole inward man, his spirit and his soul. His soul was in the lusting. You know, Jesus said, out of the heart comes adulteries and fornications. What was he referring to? He was referring to the sinful nature. David had a sinful nature. He went into the tabernacle. He got down before God and repented of his sin with Bathsheba, having her husband Uriah killed. And he cried out, Create in me a clean heart and renew in me a right spirit, O God. David wasn't praying for his spirit to get born again, for God to give him a new heart here, because it wasn't possible yet. So what David was praying for was that he would get a right spirit here. His soul would get clean. He'd be clean in his soul. I repent of that sin I committed, that lustful thoughts I had, that idea of having Uriah killed. Lord, create, clean up my soul for me. The word of God given to them in the Old Testament was intended to clean up the soul, to clean up the behavior. There was no hope yet of cleaning up the real person on the inside because they couldn't be born again until Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. So this is David. So by rights, for you to pray that prayer, you the new creation, you're looking back to what was, we could say. Because you have been, God has created in you a clean heart, referring to you, the Spirit. Create in me a clean heart and renew a right spirit in me. Okay. Now, the next thing is, if you think about it, creating, God can cleanse you of sin. But as far as getting a right if you think of spirit as meaning an attitude, mentally, mind, you're working on your soul, your mental attitude, your emotions getting straightened out, repenting of anger or whatever, jealousy, whatever it might have been that caused you to sin. You repent and God cleanses the conscience of those things. But as far as, what does it say here? Renew a right spirit within me, a right attitude. That really is our responsibility, taking the word of God, Paul said, and renewing our minds. Also, in the New Testament, he said, walk after the spirit, and then you won't fall in to these things. Now, just to show you that this definition of created me a clean heart, and renew a right spirit. This word heart in the Hebrew, I want you to look at the definition of it with me. 
I thought it very interesting when I looked up this word in the Hebrew that the first definitions that came up had to do with the mind. Mind, knowledge, thinking, reflection, memory, inclination, resolution, determination of the will, the conscience, the heart of moral character, the seat of appetites, the seat of emotions and passions, the seat of courage. So we can see that this Hebrew definitions all apply to the activities of the soul. If you go back to our to the beginning, to the definitions that we had of soul, the activities of your soul, the seat of your thinking, your uh, moral character, your appetites, emotions, passions, your knowledge, all of those were definitions for the soul that were given under soul. <clears throat> so it was interesting here, David wasn't asking God to take away his sinful nature. He was asking God to clean up his soul. That's where the trouble was at. Again, David, it wasn't possible for him to get the new nature yet. Here we have David. He's praying. God, create in me a clean heart and renew a right spirit within me. He wasn't praying to get born again. He was praying for his soul to be cleaned up. His, what is it? Mind, knowledge, thinking, memory, patience, his mind and his emotions, his soul. He was praying for his soul to get cleaned up. Lord, clean me up. Huh. But then even with David. Oh my goodness, you go through the Psalms, Psalm 19, Psalm 119, Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. David had departed from the word when he got into the sin with Bathsheba. So even in the old covenant, people that weren't born again, the word of God was the guide for the soul just like it is for us today. As long as David stayed in the word, his mind, he will keep you in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee. We talked a little bit about the importance of watching what's going on in your mind. So I just wanted to talk about this, this verse a little bit and maybe cast a little new creation light on it. You can pray the prayer, many of you have prayed it, and I'm not saying don't do it. But I find that I don't pray that prayer much anymore. I know I'm a new creation. I live from that knowledge. And if I have issues in my soul, my mind, my will, my emotions, I get the word of God and I give it a good scrubbing. I practice the fruit of the spirit that's in my recreated spirit. Your spirit is full of the, the fruits of the spirit, God's emotions. Patience, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, long-suffering. Your spirit is full of God's emotions. And when your natural emotions get out of control, you are to take God's emotions, which are in your spirit, and harness your emotions. Sing to yourself in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Again, Romans and verse in Romans. Don't be conformed to the world. David conformed to the world when he committed that sin. He could have uh, used Romans 12, 1 and 2 a little bit, I think. Don't be conformed to the world. Present your body as a living sacrifice to God, Romans 12, 1. And don't be conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. God has given us everything we need. He has given us a clean heart. He has given us a right spirit in giving us the new birth. Now he's given us the tools we need with the name of Jesus, the armor of God, the new creation realities to deal with our soul.
to renew our minds. He's given us the tools to keep a clean soul. He's given us the tools to keep a clean soul. He's given us a clean spirit. Now he's given us the tools to keep a clean soul. And that is our responsibility to keep our clean soul, our soul clean. And then your body will stay clean. Your body may want to succumb to temptations. Thoughts enter the soul. Dark shadows are cast in there of sin. Well, then it's up to you, the new man within, to put on the word of God, get your mind on the word, and drive out or resist the darkness that's trying to overtake you by coming against your body. Come In the natural circumstances of life that we deal with, things come at us every day. But you have get been given a clean heart and a right spirit. And if you will start from there in dealing with your issues of life, if you need to repent of sin, just ask forgiveness from the blood of Jesus and get up and go on. From your position as a new creation, step in the identity of you, the new creation, not the identity of this person in Psalm 51, that once again needs to have a new heart and a right spirit created in them. See, the word create is very important in that verse. God has created in you a clean heart, referring to you, the spirit, the new creation. He has, has renewed a right spirit within you, and the right spirit that is within you is the Holy Spirit. You couldn't get any more right than that. Now, Paul says we are to work out what has now been put within us. The clean heart and the right spirit are to be worked out into our everyday life still while we're here on this earth. You know, this has been quite a little bit today already. I think this has been a good crack. I may do one more verse and then we'll stop for right now. I'm going to go over to the New Testament now and pick up a New Testament verse. Romans 2, 28 and 29, I don't hear that talked about very much, but I think the reason is because people are not yet totally understanding that they are a spirit, they possess a soul, they live in a body, and what it meant to become a new creation in Christ Jesus. We're all still getting a hold of that, I think. But here in Romans 2, 28 and 29, it reads, For he is not a Jew, which is one outwardly. Neither is that circumcision, which is outward in the flesh. But he is a Jew, which is one inwardly. And circumcision is that of the heart in the spirit, and not in the letter, whose praise is not of men, but of of God. It's interesting, Paul himself was a natural Jew and he had experienced outward circumcision in the flesh. Yet he has come to understand that the true Jew is one who's had a circumcision of the heart and then he defines what part he's talking about in the spirit and not in the letter. Paul is speaking of the new birth here. That the true Jew, he calls him, is one who inwardly has become the new creation in Christ. Well, let's dissect this verse a little bit more now. Slowly but surely. <laughs> Amen. So here we have, let's take this man here who is a Jew outwardly. The Jewish person let's say under the Old Covenant, who is a Jew outwardly in the flesh. He's been born of the seed of Abraham. Now, it's not talking about him inside. It's talking about him outside, Paul says, in the flesh. That this man has been circumcised the eighth day according to the command of God to Abraham. To enter the Abrahamic covenant, Jewish babies that were born of the house 
of Abraham, the family of Abraham, were circumcised in their flesh of their foreskin on the eighth day. Paul now is telling us. Now, some of you may not think of this or, or remember it, but in Galatians, Paul said a gospel was given to me, a message by the Lord Jesus Christ himself. It didn't come to me from man. It didn't originate with man. It said the gospel that I preach. So here in Romans 2, 28, we hear Paul preaching the gospel that was given to him by the Lord Jesus Christ. Such a thing has never been heard before. Circumcision of the heart? What is that? Well, Paul is contrasting it now to the outward circumcision in the flesh to the circumcision of the heart. Circumcision of the heart. See, you didn't know it, but when you were born again, you underwent a circumcision. The old nature, the old things passed away. God didn't circumcise your soul. You're still the same you in the soul, your mind, your will, and your emotions. But in your heart, heart here referring to your spirit, you the spirit, the real you. God took his word, you were born again by the incorruptible seed of the word of God. Hebrews 4.12 tells us that the word of God is sharper than a two-edged sword. One version says it's sharper than a surgeon's scalpel. So God performed an operation on you when you got born again. But usually at that time, all we know is our sins are forgiven. That's why we need Paul's gospel, so that we get a revelation of what happened to us when we received Jesus as Savior. It was more than getting sins forgiven. That's why the gospel, this message of the new creation, is the gospel that was given to Paul. Who you are in Christ and who Christ is in you. So let's read it again. For he is not a Jew, and this is a Jew outward Jew in the flesh writing this. That's why this had to been a revelation to him. For he is not a Jew which is one outwardly, neither is that circumcision which is outward in the flesh. But he is a Jew which is one inwardly. <laughs> Listen to what it's saying. He is a Jew which is one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart in the spirit, and not in the letter, whose praise is not of men, but of God. So here we go. When you were born again by a surgeon, a surgery, a spiritual surgery that God performed on you, he circumcised, he cut away the sinful nature. And he gave you a new nature. He cut away the old heart, sinful heart, heart referring in this instance to the spirit, the sinful nature that was in you. And he put a new heart and a new spirit on the inside of you. And you were circumcised. You underwent a spiritual circumcision. Let's read it again. He is a Jew, which is one inwardly and circumcision is that of the heart in the spirit not in the soul you're to renew your mind to take care of the soul now it's our responsibility to deal with that God already took care of the real you he performed an operation he circumcised out of you the devil's nature the sinful nature, and he put his nature, a new heart, a new spirit, inside of you. You underwent a spiritual circumcision in you, the real person, the spirit. Most of us don't even know that we are a spirit when we get born again. <laughs> All we know is that burden of sin rolled away. 
and it felt so good and we knew we were right with God and we were a child of God and we wanted to please God. Oh yes, hallelujah. <laughs> I'm thinking here now. Oh, I think I better stop here today. There's just one more here I wanted to um, go to, but we'll cover it the next time. Paul said in Romans 1 9, he said, I serve God with my spirit. I thought that was interesting. I serve God with my spirit. Hmm. I take that to mean I'm a spirit. I possess a soul. I live in a body. So in my service to God, I am to lead off with the real me, the new creation. And then work on my soul and let my soul come along behind and then my body behind that. But see, the Holy Spirit bears witness with your spirit, you the spirit. The Holy Spirit, Romans 8 says, bears witness with your spirit that you are a child of God. He doesn't bear witness to your soul. So Paul said, I serve God with my spirit. He led off in his service to God following the inward witness that was in his soul. But going back again, spirit, soul, body. The word heart can refer to you the spirit, it can refer to you the soul, and it can sometimes refer to the physical heart in your body. So I think you see now why we're kind of looking at some of these different verses. But I just want you to think about the two I've left you with today. Psalm 51, it really isn't a prayer that uh, the church should be praying, those that are born again. If you're born again, you've been given a clean heart and a right spirit. What you need to do now is renew your mind. God can't do that for you. He can help you to get your emotions under control, maybe. But ultimately, it's up to you to take the fruit of God's spirit, his character, his emotions, and put them on your soul. And say, no, I'm not giving in to this anger or rage or fear. Resist these things when they want to come at you and stir up things in your soul. Keep your soul clean before God. Keep that heart clean. Create in me a clean heart and renew a right spirit in me. Keep your soul heart clean before God. God has cleaned up your spirit heart. Hallelujah. And Third John 2 says that if you will get your uh, soul prospering in the knowledge of some of these things that it'll spill over into your provision in life and the health of your body. Beloved, I desire above all things that you prosper and be in health even as your soul prospers. So we see again the three parts of us even there that you prosper financially, be in health physically, and it depends upon how your soul prospers. But prosperity of our soul, that our soul heart, if you want to say, is not up to God. It's up to us. With meekness, receive, engraft the word of God. Receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save your soul. But just to simplify things again now before we close. Going back to our definitions now for a moment. Again, in the Greek, the word is cardia for the word heart. They have one word. You know, it's sort of just like they have one word for love. We have one word for love, but the Greek has four different words. Well, here they have one word for heart, and it has all these different meanings. One or three basic different meanings. The physical heart in your body, and the center and seat of your spiritual life, your inward being, the inward you, your spirit and soul together. Then it can also mean just your soul or just your spirit. 
movement. Again, just outward and inward. Heart outward, meaning your physical heart. Heart inward, meaning your inward man. The hidden man of the heart made up of the spirit and the soul. And then you have to determine, the way it's used in scripture, is that word heart applying to me the spirit or to my soul or both. So we're digging around in this. This is just more of a little um, for the technically inclined, I guess I would call it. For those of you that just want to go a little deeper in, I thought about these things for years, and it's always kind of troubled me. I sit in services, and I hear different verses come up as they're being taught or preached about. And I guess because of the years of study that I have done in spirit, soul, and body, a lot of times I want to jump up and say, if you would clarify what part of me the word heart you're using is applied to right now, I could get a lot more use out of this scripture you're preaching. When the word heart is clumped together, meanings can mean the spirit, can mean the mind, the will, the emotions. And the word heart is used one word, and it isn't clarified which part of you they're referring to when they're using that scripture. Sometimes they use scriptures that don't even apply to you that have the word heart in them. So that's the reason that I have wanted to do this study on heart. I know it's a little bit more technical than the simpler things and more practical teachings. But if you can labor with this just a little bit, put a little time into it, you will see the benefit. And you will be able, when you're sitting in a service and you hear a scripture used that has the word heart in it, you will be able to discern, first of all, does that scripture even apply to me as a new creation? And then, if you sense that it does, or it appears that it does, then you say, well, now let's see, what part of me is that word heart in this verse referring to? Is it referring to me, the spirit? Or is it referring to my mind, my emotions, my will? What part of me is this verse addressing? Oh my, it's very helpful. It will help you grow. It helps you grow up. It helps you grow in strength. It helps you grow in discernment. Hebrews 4 talks about, well, Timothy. Paul wrote to Timothy. He said, study to show yourself approved so you can rightly divide the word of truth. So these two verses I shared with you today, I've had, I've had several more that I had prepared. But I think that this is enough today to get your head all in a tizzy. <laughs> in Romans 6, 17, Paul says, you have obeyed from the heart. Hmm, that's interesting. We talked about, uh, we'll talk about 2 Corinthians 9, 7, as every man purposes in his heart. It's interesting. And the multitude of them that believed were of one heart and one soul. That's a good one too. Ephesians 5, uh, 19. Singing and making melody in your heart unto the Lord. You know, a lot of times when I talk to you about you can be in church and your spirit and your body's engaged in praise and worship, but your head's off someplace else. The reason that I think about that is because I thought all these verses through, and I've decided what part these different of me these different words are applying to, and it helps me to get myself together in unity, and be as one before the Lord, one in purpose, 
loving the Lord my God with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength. And that is a very interesting verse right there, too. Each one of those words is a different word in the Greek. Heart, soul, mind, and strength. Mm -mm -mm. Hallelujah. There's another interesting one we hear a lot. Matthew 5, 15, 19. Out of the heart proceed evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, blasphemies. That doesn't apply to you as a new creation. Not to your heart. Now your soul may be unrenewed yet, and some of it's coming out of there. But surely I hope not murders and thefts and adulteries. I hope you progress beyond that. But as far as out of your heart, this word heart here does not apply to you, the new creation. It applies to your, if you want to apply the verse, apply it to your soul. But honestly, it doesn't apply to any part of you. If you want to just get right down to it, Jesus was speaking here before the cross. The people that were in this state right here, that's all that could come out of them. Now, I was thinking about Mary and Zechariah and um, um, Elizabeth and Joseph, and some of the others. And I said, Lord, how does that verse out of the uh, evil heart, adulteries and fornications, I said, Lord, they didn't do that. They were right before you. He said, because my, he told me, he said, because my word governed their soul. So what was in their spirit, the sinful nature, didn't manifest in their lives. Even though Mary had to be born again, just like anybody else. In the upper room, she was there on the day of Pentecost. It specifically mentions Mary, the mother of Jesus. She had to be filled with the Spirit also. But the Word of God, they were obedient to the Word of God. They had a clean soul before the Lord, even if they weren't born again. So that verse there doesn't apply to them in particular. But most of the people that Jesus was referring to, that does apply to them. Out of the heart, he was trying to get them focused on what was going on in here, in their hearts that they needed. He said to, jo to uh, Nicodemus, you must be born again. Nicodemus says, how can that be? I can't go back into my mother's womb. All Nicodemus was thinking about the outward part, the flesh. Jesus was talking all the time to get them to focus that there's an inward part of them. And that's the part that needed cleaned up. That's the part that needed him. That's the part that needed to be born again. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, Jesus told Nicodemus. That which is born of the spirit is spirit. Hallelujah. So I thank you for your patience. As you let me work through this, this is the first time I've really attempted to wade into these things that I thought about for many years and to actually put them in a form that I could con begin conveying them to others. Hallelujah. It'll set you free in a lot of areas if you learn to discern which part of you the word heart in a verse is referring to. And you'll start sensing those different parts of you and how they're to work and what you're to do with them. I guess that's how I would sum up my purpose in doing this. Father, I thank you today. Oh, Father, make it plain where possibly I haven't. Just open the blind a little bit, Father, and stir up their curiosity. Hmm. This is rather interesting. Sounds confusing, but interesting. I think I'll think about this a little bit. I think I'll look into it. Hmm. So, Father, I thank you that it's not by might or by power, but it's by your Spirit. And Lord, just as you instructed me over the years and how this scalpel of your Spirit works in rightly dividing the Word, and applying it, Father, the word heart. Oh, Father, help us to know ourselves and to know your word and what part of us it applies to. And Father, I thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. 
will join me in the next session. I'm not maybe going to do a whole lot of sessions on this. Just introducing the subject to you. Stir, stirring up your pure minds, I guess I would say. Going over a few verses and getting you started. And from there on, we may touch on it periodically. But give you something else to pursue. Check in later. God bless you all today.